maximizer, relater, responsibility, learner, and discipline. My name is Dr. Sabrina Starling, and I'm the CEO at Tap the Potential. My biggest aha moment around learning my strengths was that I was overdoing things, and I really needed to learn how to channel my energy so that I could get better results for myself in my life and for our clients. I'm Darren Barasami. I'm Brandon Miller. And this is The Strengths Whisperer, the show empowering leaders to create, build, and sustain great places to work. On this episode, we have Dr. Sabrina Starling, the CEO of Tap the Potential. Dr. Sabrina, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you on. Darren, I'm excited to be here. It's an honor every time we get to have a conversation, and particularly when we get to talk about one of our favorite subjects, strengths. It is so true. Strengths is really a powerful tool, powerful experience, not only in the workplace, but just as a way of life and how we're living and how we're doing it. Dr. Sabrina, how were you first introduced to strengths? Like, what was it that got you into even that way of thinking even before you got into the Clifton Strengths Finder? Well, when I went through my own coach training, somewhere along the line, somebody said, you need to take Strengths Finder and understand your top strengths. And That really appealed to me because in my background in psychology, everything in my graduate training was about deficits and helping people overcome problems in their past. And I'm someone who just really likes to look at, well, where are things strong? What are the wins and successes? And can we build on those? And the whole notion that we all have different unique strengths totally appealed to me. And I'm just going to blow this right out of the water right here. I'm a maximizer. (laughs) That side of me just wants to know what everyone's strengths are and how I can help them use their strengths to really tap their potential. One of the things that I'm so aware of is we can't tap potential on our own. We need to do it with teams and we need others around us with complementary strengths for us to really be at our best. That's what piqued my interest. And so even before you and I connected, I had taken StrengthsFinder and I had my top strengths, but I really wasn't using them effectively. I hadn't gone deep with it yet. And Maximizer, I know that one resonates really strongly for you. Tell our listeners, what is a Maximizer? What does it mean, as you understand it, to be a Maximizer? Because I know it's one that has resonated with you for many years. As a coach, I would have coaching sessions with clients and we would look at a new strategy or something new that they were going to do in their business. And I wouldn't just stop there. I would say, and then you could do this and then it could be this and then it could be that. And before I knew it, I had totally overwhelmed them (laughs) because when you're in coaching, you're usually in coaching because the business is overwhelming and you need things to be broken down and, and step by step. My maximizer was just constantly looking for how could I make this better? How could I do more? And in my personal life, I was overcommitting to all kinds of things. If something interested me, I wanted to do it. And I didn't want to just do it a little. I wanted to do it all the way and big. And so learning that my maximizer is a strength, but I have to rein it in and use it appropriately. The word for me is channel that energy. When I learned to channel it, I became a lot more effective. It's really powerful learning how to channel to aim our strengths, because if not, they just kind of leap from us. It's just who we are. They come out and they're showing up as assets, and sometimes they're showing up as liabilities, and sometimes deep liabilities. It's just a function of we're not aiming them properly. One of the pieces that I wanted to just pick up on there, because you mentioned in your personal life, and it sounds like personal and professional, you could be an overcommitter. Out of your other strengths in your top 10, Were there other strengths in there that showed up, Dr. Sabrina, that when they're coupled with like this block of strengths actually caused you to be a serial overcommitter and how you've managed through that? Because I've definitely have lived through being a serial overcommitter through some of my strengths. Any other ones in there that you can see in your top 10 that might have played into that serial overcommitter? My second one is relator. And so I connect with people really well. And that means for me, I also don't like to let people down. And so if I commit to something, I want to follow it through. And then I have responsibility as my third thrown in there. So of course, I'm going to be responsible if I've committed and discipline. And so I would put pressure on myself. Discipline is my number five. I put pressure on myself to follow through on all these places where I was over committing 
myself. One of the key areas where I'll overcommit is learning. That's my number four. I love to learn. I love new things. And if I take something on, I don't want to do it halfway. I want to do it all the way and I want to go deep. So yeah, I was a hot mess with my strengths on overcommitment. The serial overcommitter terminology, because we've had this conversation in the past and responsibility, your number three is one of the most frequent recurring strengths even in people's top five. So it's very common to have in our top five. And our listeners might be going, oh my gosh, I'm a total serial committer. People will ask me things and I just say yes, as if the word no didn't exist. I think what's fascinating about the responsibility strength, we got to say yes to saying no. Say yes to saying no, because when we're saying yes to too many things, especially when you have responsibility in Maximizer, because Maximizer wants to make good, better, great and excellent. We want to Mm -hmm. take it to the moon. So we want to keep leveling it up. So when we say yes to too many things, we water down our resources. We might deliver. I'll just share the story. I would deliver through responsibility. I would get things done that I overcommitted to and work myself ragged to get something done. But yet, even though I got it done and it was good enough, maybe even better than what somebody else was expecting, By my own standards, it was still not what I knew I was capable of. So I still felt that I was letting people down and just creating this tornado of torment that was self-inflicted, actually. Was any of that true for you? And how did you manage around channeling, in your words, your strengths and combining them to a way that they actually got you to the outcomes that you wanted? Absolutely. I had that going on. And one of the things that I came to realize when I was in graduate school many years ago is that when I was doing something and I thought it was at an 80% or 90%, other people perceived it as 100% or 95%. And so I learned that I needed to have better standards for myself, lower my expectations for myself. As I started to learn about strengths, I became much more aware of channeling where am I going to maximize? So if I'm going to maximize what our clients that tap the potential need the most is for things to be simple. So I maximize making things simple now, rather than how can I overcomplicate it for somebody just to show my value. I've had to learn where value comes from for overworked business owners, and that is making their lives better by simplifying things in their business for them. But also recognizing that in my own business, this is a constant conversation we have in our team, is how can we simplify this? Where are we trying to over deliver and make things too complicated in general? And so we're constantly coming back to what is our sweet spot? What is absolutely necessary that our clients need? And how can we do that really well for them? And not just start adding this and adding that and making it more and more complicated. That's really, really important. The name of the business, Tap the Potential, part of tapping the potential is actually revealing what the potential is. I think Mike Michalowicz said this in the pumpkin plan. Many businesses don't fail for a lack of ideas. They actually drown in them. That's the issue. So the potential is actually taking the time to sit with what are the true drivers and understanding what is the real potential that a person brings, not they can do anything and they can do everything because that leads us to a burnout. I think one thing that's interesting in your strengths, your combination of very rare strengths, you've got discipline at number five, you've got significance at number eight and focus at number nine. If we take the average just in the United States alone, we would look at an average profile of everybody that's taken Clifton Strengths Finder. We would find that significance, focus, and discipline most frequently recur in the 30 through 34 position out of all of the 34 themes. And the fact that you have those three in such a high position is very, very unique. Now, focus, fascinatingly enough, can more directly boil things down to their essence and get there. And it's something that's easy for many of us to say, oh, you just got to create structure. But creating that structure is something that discipline naturally does. And then focus will actually put the blinders on, close the windows to allowing new things in and help keep people on task towards that one thing. And that is truly a unique gift that those strengths bring as you've learned to really own them and aim them and channel them Mm -hmm. towards the outcomes that you seek. 
we can get them aligned and kind of working. Because that's the fascinating part, I think, what you've said, Dr. Sabrina, about strengths is they'll do their own thing, do whatever it is that they want. But when we actually think about which strengths should I be using right now? No, let them fire, but what should I be doing right now? That can take us to a powerful place. And bringing this full circle back to the over committing part, it's a simple question you can ask if you find that you're a serial over committer. Maybe that's through responsibility. Maybe it's through maximizer. Maybe it's through a combination of those. Sometimes achievers can be this way as well. Oftentimes, we'll get the question from somebody, can you do this? And when you're a serial over committer, the answer to that is always yes. Of course I can do that, right? The real question that we must ask when asked, can you do something, is asking ourselves, should I do this? And when we shift that can to a should, it actually helps us to see what is our greatest potential? What is our greatest essence that we give? And is this going to detract us from getting there? And this is a very interesting piece that when we're coaching leaders and organizations that have just moved into leadership roles, are you actually detracting from somebody that you're managing? Because you're taking work that you could be using to actually grow your next tier. So it actually can lead to a walking out the door of our talent, of who we're looking for, right? Absolutely. And one of the things that has really helped me really learn how to channel my strengths is learning about the 80-20 principle years ago and recognizing that 80% of our results come from 20% of our activities. And when I started my business and I was a new mother and I had a business and a baby to take care of, and I just couldn't figure out where to focus because I felt like I was pulled all over the place. I got really clear on myself that I needed to identify my highest value activities each day. And I've used that over these years with business owners. And a lot of it comes from my own learning. And we talk about your chart of $10,000 an hour activities. Those are the highest value activities in the business that you should be focusing on. What's so interesting to me is that we often keep our team from working from their highest value activities, their greatest contributions, which come from their strengths, because we think, we can do it. And so we should do it. And we don't even stop to think about, well, does someone else on my team have a strength where they could be doing this and they could probably do it better than I could because they're not as overcommitted as I am. And so I just love carrying that question for myself when I'm dealing with my team members is, you know, if I'm overwhelmed and I'm overcommitted, what can I take off my plate that somebody else's strength and that creates a high value activity for them to be doing. I don't have to be the only one in the business doing the highest value activities and I shouldn't be. That's really insightful. And it really lends to this notion of self-awareness that we have to grow that strengths gives us the opportunity to do and the journey from self-awareness to team awareness, right? Do you have any insights to share with our listeners on that journey? One of the things that I have learned in dealing with our team members and our clients' team members is that we take our strengths for granted. They're so much a part of who we are. We just think everybody else in the world, these things must come easy to them and they must see the world in these ways and want to do things in these ways in this world. And what I've learned in coming to understand my strengths is number one, they make me unique. They make me different. Not everybody sees the world in the same way. And in working with team members, I really become very intentional about getting them to be a gift from their gifts. We do this in one of our programs, Leadership Boot Camp, where we send the A players in our clients' businesses through Leadership Boot Camp. They learn about their strengths. And I ask them every week to do a secret mission. What they're doing on the secret mission is they're looking for who in the company, either a client, a colleague, fellow team member who's struggling with something and where can I step up from my strengths to support them? And what happens from week to week when they come back and they share their secret mission, number one, they realize that working from their strengths energizes them. They get excited about it. They're helping someone else. And what seems easy to them is not easy for the other person on the team. And so what really comes out of that is people start to appreciate their unique gifts, their strengths. The things that we tend to take for granted because it seems like, well, this comes easy to me, but it doesn't come easy to other people. And we minimize that in terms of learning and what I would love to convey here for people to take away is talk to your team weekly 
about where their wins and successes are and how they're unique in bringing about those wins and successes. Help them to start to see the value of their strengths so they don't minimize them. That minimization happens way too often. It's so true. And bringing this back to your earlier comments about when you were in grad school and you came to find out in psychology it was this deficit fixation, we're conditioned to constantly think, well, I'm good at that. So therefore, I don't need to invest in that. I'm going to look for all the areas that I'm not strong. And this is how we've been conditioned. It comes up sometimes not from a bad place that comes from a place of good intention. Sometimes it's our parents. Sometimes it's our schooling. Sometimes it's the activities that we participated in. Many times it's the workplaces that we're in, but the intentions are good. It's through the lens of, I want to develop you. You're already good at that. We're going to not worry about those elements. Our listeners won't be able to see this, but hanging over my shoulder is one of my bases. And I've learned to play lots and lots of other instruments. And I could play them well, but I can play a bass far, far better than any other instrument that I can. And every time I've played other instruments, I approached it through the lens of how do I learn to be a better bass player? So it was getting into other positions to understand the bass from a different lens within music you'll hear many organizations get people into different rotations. It can help heighten people's strengths. But when we're leading teams, we really want to understand, well, what are people's strengths? Sometimes walking in somebody else's shoes helps them to better understand their own role. But when they are really a genius in their role, let's make sure that we let them see why their genius matters. It can help validate why that actually matters and how it creates such impact. Before you started Tap the Potential, you were in the hospital world and you've really developed yourself as an organizational psychologist. If my memory serves me correctly, there was some turmoil, shall we say, in your past experiences. You even conducted some research on this, right, Dr. Sabrina, about effectively scar tissue that exists in organizations from bad leadership. Can you share with our listeners a little bit about that journey and what that's like? One of the things that baffled me as I was going through graduate school, I did internships and practicums in different settings, hospital settings, community mental health, just a wide variety. All of these were led by psychologists and psychiatrists. And there was so much drama and miscommunication and internal politics. And I kept thinking, if these are organizations led by people who have a deep understanding of human behavior and they can't get it right, what chance does the average leader have of creating a great place to work? And in my last job, before I went out on my own, we had a boss who was just outright bully. It took a couple of years. The board got rid of him and we brought in new leadership and I stayed and I watched and I thought, okay, well, we got rid of bad boss. Now things are going to be better. And they weren't better. It took years and, you know, it can take up to seven years for an organization to heal from bullying behavior at the leadership level. I did all I could internally from my role, which was mid-level management at that point, to make things better and create a great place to work. And that's really where my desire to create great places to work came from, because I saw that I was spending so much of my life at work, and not just at work physically, but mentally at work when I wasn't physically at work, thinking about all the things at work. And I just thought, I want to help people create better work experiences. If we're going to work this much in our lives, we should really enjoy our work. <laughs> That's why I get so excited about helping small business owners create great places to work. What I see going on with small business owners is there's a certain percentage of small business owners. It's not all of them, but there's a certain percentage that really genuinely want to create a great place to work and lack the skills to do that. So there's a desire, but a lack of know-how. And I love getting in there with the ones who really want to learn how and who are doing it and making that happen. And it's a beautiful thing when you go from being this overworked business owner, feeling disgruntled because your team keeps letting you down. And then you recognize, you know what? I've learned how to hire A players. I need to trust them. I need to understand what their strengths are and support them in working from their strengths and set them up for success rather than being the one in the business who tries to do it all. I want to get back for our listeners to a single comment. He said, seven years to heal from bullying leadership. 
what is some of the lingering scars that take place? What are the behaviors, the actions that we can look for within organizations that might be in year two or year three, or maybe that just are stuck in a cycle? What does that look like from your lens? I'm going to just talk about my personal experience with it because that's much more real than any statistic I can share. So we got rid of bad boss and then I thought things were going to get better. But what I found is that there were other great people on the team that I had lost trust in because they had been doing what they needed to do to survive in that company. Their actions were not consistent with their values And I didn't feel like I could trust them anymore. And so I had this sense of isolation. Like, I don't know who I can talk to and confide in on this team anymore because people have engaged in bad behavior out of a need for self-preservation. That was hard for me. The other things that were hard is that I had people who'd lost faith in me. And I had to look in my own mirror and say, oh my goodness, I have done things to keep my job that may have made other people feel like they can't trust me. So I had to go to work on starting to repair that. All of that takes a lot of mental energy from doing my job. So my job was to do therapy with mentally ill people. (laughs) And here I am having to repair myself or, you know, try to work with coworkers and figure out if I can trust them or not. And so this is what it's like for anyone in any organization where there's been bad leadership and bullying behavior. It leaves a scar. It takes a long time to work through all of that. And it's not just a matter of getting rid of that person. There were other leaders in the company who had observed the behavior and turned a blind eye. So we had to figure out if we could trust them. When we don't trust as human beings, we freeze up. And we don't connect with people. We're not real. We're not authentic. We're coming to work with our armor on. If you've ever worked in a corporation, I know many of your listeners have, you learn that you put your work face on and you don't let on when things are troubling you or bothering you. But meanwhile, all that is going on in your head. And so to just kind of bring this full circle, when we have people on our team that we're hiring and we think, we're good bosses. We've learned how to create these great places to work. We've worked on our leadership. We're good and we care about them. And we bring them in for a one-to-one and we want to know what support they need. And we want to talk to them about their strengths. And we talk to them about their hopes and their dreams and their goals. And they look at us and they clam up and they won't tell us anything except these one word responses. And we think, well, there must be something wrong with my leadership. Maybe I need some more coaching skills. Maybe I'm not asking the right questions. What we forget is what kind of leadership have they been exposed to in the past? Because they bring that forward into their relationships with us and their fellow team members. And it is our job to help them recognize this is a safe place. It's so powerful what you just said, because a lot of times leaders might feel, why is this person acting like this towards me? I haven't done anything to be treated like this or to have a response like that. And when we're coaching, a lot of times they're not responding to you. They're responding to the relationship and the conditioned response that they might have had from a previous leader that they work with. And they just feel that that's the way that you act within this relationship. And to your point, we've got to develop that psychological circle of safety where people feel they can articulate, they can put their cards on the table and it's going to be okay. And we can have a healthy conversation We can have conflict in a healthy way. Conflict is very healthy. We can't just sit there, sweep it under the rug. We have to actually do that in a healthy way and manner. Dr. Sabrina, with your learnings from what you learned while you were working in that organization to coaching others to what you have built within Tap the Potential, tell us a little bit about how you folded in different strengths practices into the team that you lead to the business that you have built over the past several years? What's one practice that has come up either in your one-to-ones or across the organization? And I know some of these might not even be using directly Clifton Strengths, but you're using the thinking of strengths-based thinking within the organization to create that type of culture. What's one thing that has been really powerful and a driver for your team or your one-to-ones? Even through the hiring process, we are looking for what is someone's strength and trying to understand that. And we're talking about that. 
as they come on board with us. So we follow who, which is an interview process by one of the smarts, and I can't remember his first name right now. In that interview process, you check references and you check references in a little bit non-conventional way where you identify people in the applicant's background who could verify all the great things the applicant is telling you that they've done in their past. And then they have to set up reference calls. And in going through that process, yes, we are checking references, but I've also learned I'm learning about people's strengths and their opportunities where they need support and where they can grow. And so those conversations have been integral to how we start onboarding our team members. So when team members come on board at Tap the Potential, we're not putting a bunch of paperwork in front of them and telling them about our policies and procedures. That's not where we start. We start with, let's talk about your strengths. What are the things that light you up? What are the areas that excite you? What are the things that drain your energy? And I give them permission from day one to tell me what drains them. I don't want them working on an ongoing basis from their Achilles heels or from the areas that drain them because they won't be happy long-term with us. That has come back to me as feedback that it's so freeing to be told from day one, tell us what you enjoy, what excites you, and tell us what drains your energy. So there's open conversation about that from the start. It just sets the foundation. It's interesting. I'm reminded of a conversation I had here on the Strengths Whisper with one of our guests, a gentleman, Tony Grebmeyer. He's CEO of a company called Ship Offers. In his culture, one of the parallels that he has, so the drainers, the part that you talked about, not wanting people to spend that time there, they have a process that they talk about what are your drivers and what are your drainers. So what's driving you? And that's not only in your work life, but your professional life. Like what puts gasoline in your tank and keeps your engine fueling? What are the things that cause you to de-energize and where are you at within that pulse check side? So it's pretty interesting, totally different businesses. And I know you're doing a lot of coaching and development as well for small businesses and how that's coming together, but how we're seeing these parallels within strengths-based organizations that really focus on creating great places to work, no matter their size or scale. The final question that I want to ask you because of your just profound knowledge on how to hire the best. In the hiring process, I know you've customized this to different niche markets. That's why there's three books in your series. But do you have just any general insights that you can provide that are beneficial for leaders, for teams that are thinking of making hires of what they can do to start that process on the right foot? and really make sure that they are at least screening for those A players. Before you go to hire, you really need to think about what the one thing is that you want the person in this role to do for you. And it should tie to the sweet spot of the business and profitability. And so the question I always come back to is if this person can only get one thing done for you in a given day or a given week, what is that one thing that you need them to deliver? And then what are the strengths necessary to deliver that result exceptionally well day in and day out. When you identify that and you use that as your foundation for who you're going to hire, you're going to hire somebody who's got a really good chance of succeeding in that role. That's really powerful. And just so our listeners can hear, because I know just within that series alone, you've gotten really specific in certain industries. Can you just share the names of the books and what industries you focused in on there? So How to Hire the Best, The Entrepreneur's Ultimate Guide to Attracting Top Performing Team Members is my last book in the series. It goes across industries, across geographic regions. The first book that I wrote was specific to rural business owners because when you're in a rural area, it's really hard to find people. And I wrote that book and that launched the series because I started getting phone calls from people who were not in rural areas and who said, can you help me? And I said, I don't know. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. And then the next book was for the construction industry. It's How to Hire the Best, The Contractor's Ultimate Guide to Attracting Top Performing Team Members. The construction industry struggles so much for a variety of factors in getting A players on their teams and hiring. And it's been my experience that I've seen a lot of people in the industry have lots of opportunity to grow the business and not have the team members they need. And that becomes the greatest stumbling block. And so I was excited to really dig in and solve the hiring challenge in the construction industry. 
One thing that I'll provide to all of our listeners about Dr. Sabrina Brooks, not only does she address how to hire the A players, she addresses how to retain the A players because there's no greater pain than being able to figure out the recipe to bring them in and then watch them just walk right out of your door because you didn't get your culture right. And she gets deep into that in all of her books. You know, what I will say about retention is that the majority of small business owners have no systems in place in their businesses to retain a player. So you put all this energy into getting them and you do nothing to retain them. When you are working with them from a strengths-based perspective, you're starting to develop a system to retain them. So everything that we're talking about here is key to retaining those A players on your team. And I know your focus is predominantly small business owners, and we at 34 Strong have worked all across the board from small businesses up to just large organizations. And those pieces of retention that you're talking about, we've seen that time and time again because of the old statement, people don't leave bad organizations, they leave bad bosses who are the stewards of the culture. So maybe the company culture on the website and all the things that they're putting together, it looks like we're trying to do the right thing, but it's not actually aligned the way that we are. There's just so many good nuggets that are in that whole series. So just really want to thank you, Dr. Sabrina, for joining us today and sharing your story of being a people first leader. If people want to get in touch with you or learn a little bit more about you, about Tap the Potential programs that you are offering, your podcasts, books, where can they go to find out more about you? I just want to say, first off, the Profit by Design podcast. Every week I have tips, tools, and strategies for you on how you design a sustainably profitable business that gives you more time for what matters most and more money in your bank account than ever. And by the way, that involves hiring a player so you don't have to do it all yourself <laughs> and then developing them. Go to tapthepotential.com forward slash resources. That's where we have a variety of tools to support you in hiring your A players, growing your team with A players, and really getting yourself as the business owner out of the day-to-day -day of the business. So you heard me talk about today, like the chart of $10,000 an hour activities. Head on over to tapthepotential.com forward slash resources. I think you will be very happy with what you find there to support you. For our listeners out there, are you ready to discover your strengths to accelerate into life? like Dr. Sabrina has. We believe in this path so much, we're offering our listeners the opportunity to discover their top five Clifton strengths. And all you have to do is email us at brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, at 34strong.com with the subject line top five to request your strengths finder code. Dr. Sabrina, any final closing words for our listeners. I want to thank you, Darren, and acknowledge you for the gift that you are giving from your strengths by doing this podcast and continuing to educate about the value of us learning more and more, not just about our own strengths, but really being curious about those on our teams and how we can help them develop their strengths. So for those of you listening as a fellow podcaster, podcasting is a labor of love. Show Darren some love and the 34 Strong team some love. Leave them a review because um, that helps more listeners find. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Sabrina. Really, really appreciate that. And dear listener, we want to thank you so much for joining us on the Strengths Whisper. We will see you soon.